This is Jordan Euclid, and you're listening to the Matt Balaker podcast. Hello, good people out there. Thank you once again for tuning in to the Matt Balaker podcast. It makes me feel so worthwhile and important. And if you want to get extra credit, please uh, subscribe and encourage your friends, your casual acquaintances, the person you haven't spoke to since high school, to uh, like, subscribe, and share. It'll be really good for all of us. Um, you are in for a treat today because today's guest is the guitar playing Hoosier with great <laughs> hair. He also happens to be a founding partner of Key Investment Partners and a returning guest to this podcast. So please join me in welcoming back Mr. Jordan Euclid. How are you doing, Jordan? Doing great. Thanks, Matt. Really excited to be uh, joining you for a second interview here. Yeah, that's that's quite the distinction. Uh, I mean, it's it's up there with the Fields Medal or Nobel Prize. I mean, if if you're a re anyone can you know be great once. <laughs> um, but like Aristotle, you are what you repeatedly do. So you're a repeated guest, Jordan. So um, ergo, you are great. Congratulations on that. Thank you. I'm, I'm super honored and excited to be back. As you should be. And I think there are probably a, a handful of people in the country, or I should say the world, that maybe didn't tune in to your first <laughs> appearance. Or if they did, they were busy doing other things. And, you know, shame on them. But we're carrying here at the Matt Balaker podcast. So let's, you know, revisit some of the topics we we discussed initially. Um, you know, what do you do now? And, and what was your path that led you to being this um, in investment partner? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm one of the founding partners at Key Investment Partners. Key is a uh, cannabis focused private equity firm. And so um, our full-time uh, job is to focus on investing in cannabis startups across the entire cannabis ecosystem. So both plant touching and ancillary cannabis operators. We've deployed over 40 million into the space thus far uh, across 14 different companies. Um, and we're continuing to rock and roll. You know, the um, cannabis industry is, has had a, a number of challenges over the last 12 months uh, in light of the <laughs> broader market uh, setback and all of that. But I think the thesis for the industry remains as strong as ever. And so we're just uh, excited to um, see what comes out on the other side of this storm here. Yeah, you're, you're a pro. You know your way around Excel. You've read footnotes to financial statements. And uh, I'm no Warren Buffett, but I have a question for you, Jordan. Is it better to buy when things are cheap or super inflated and expensive? Matt, that's so so funny and so accurate, right? I mean, it's of course, as everyone knows intellectually, the right time to buy is when markets have tanked and valuations are cheaper than ever before. But unfortunately, you know, investing is more about guts than it is about brains. <laughs> and, and as you know, when the whole market's down, everyone's scared, and no one wants to put money to work. So you kind of get into this uh, vicious cycle a bit in the down cycle on that front. Yeah, I think it was around 2017, possibly 2018. I mean, we saw in the cannabis space ridiculous valuations, like stocks were trading at 40 times revenue. I, I mean, just, just absurd expectations, and people were throwing money at it. And if you yeah. compare it to real estate, uh, I mean, look at 2006 through 2008. I mean, if if people were deploying capital, then they'd be reaping the rewards now. And and I see parallels. Mm -hmm. So uh, people out there, you know, be uh, was what it was it Peter Lynch said, be greedy when others are timid or be brave when others are timid. So so now's the time to be brave, step up. Totally. Now's the time to be brave and step up. Um, but it, it's more than just deploying capital. I, I mean, you had a, a a very stable job in private equity. In fact, one of the larger private equity firms in the world. And, and you left. Um, why did you do that? Yeah, it's a great question, Matt. You know, I think a few things. I think number one, I've just always um, had an entrepreneurial and independent spirit. And so, you know, while I, I loved my time at that private equity firm, and I just learned so much. Uh, I also, um, didn't want to be uh, just an employee in a massive corporation, right? I, I felt like I wanted to start something on my own. 
you know, um, cannabis. I'd never been a super frequent consumer, at least until I moved to Colorado. Um, <laughs> it, it's required. They're like, welcome to the state. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You get, uh, here's 50 milligrams. Welcome Enjoy. back with a Subaru and a golden retriever. And a bag <laughs> of like you so, don't have a beard um, yet. Please grow one in the next four minutes now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so anyway, um, Saw the opportunity in cannabis, you know, just naturally living in in Denver, saw the massive growth of the industry. Um, and as we started to get smarter on it, you know, it came to recognize very quickly that, as you well know, that capital for the cannabis industry is incredibly scarce, right? And so we saw this uh, investment opportunity for a sector that had huge tailwinds of growth and demand for capital on the one hand, but a very limited supply of capital on the other. So my partners and I, you know, got together and, and figured who better than us to really uh, come in and, and really figure out a way to fund this emerging industry. So you, you, you didn't just think about it, you did it. And I, th you know, therefore you're ahead of 97% of people. Um, so I, I applaud you for that. And, you know, I've worked on and off in the cannabis industry, gosh, for about 12 years, may, maybe a little bit longer. And one, one thing that I like kind of more than anything is how kind of collegial it is, uh, how, mm -hmm. how uh, you know, it's changed a little bit, but for the most part, I can just call someone at a firm I've, I know nothing about. I think this is maybe how I met you, Jordan, it's, it's hard to say. And most of the time, they're very cool and they're very welcoming. Has that been your experience? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think um, like any industry, it's got its its sharks. Like any new industry, uh, <laughs> it can often attract some criminals to begin with, frankly. But I think uh, you know that type of noise that happens in every sector, especially new sectors, and so that always shakes out because you know people don't want to do work with people who are vultures, and you know <laughs> criminals typically, not always, um, unfortunately, do get caught in the long run. So, um, so I think the group of folks that we like to do business with in the industry still remains relatively small and relatively tight knit, and so um, I, I totally agree. I mean, one of the most fun parts about working in the sector has been just uh, getting to know all these other cannabis investors and executives, right? I mean, I think it just attracts a certain uh, a certain type of individual, right? I mean, you you know, you kind of have to naturally be entrepreneurial in the first place, and then cannabis itself, uh, I think, frankly, attracts folks who um, who don't. Um, subscribe to the status quo who don't accept the system because it's the way it's always been or that's what you know some some regulators 50 years ago told them it should be and that has really been a benefit for me just in terms of re-examining the current regulatory structure of the world that we live in and and kind of how systemically we got to this place in time and I'm glad you say that because yeah, it's it's not for people who just put their nose down and comply with everything. I mean, in, in in certain circles, it's still a little bit forbidden, and I mean, it's changing, but but still, you have to have a little bit of a rebellious attitude, I think, to uh, to get into it. But you're you're a rebel and a gentleman, Jordan. And now we're at a time when, uh, yeah, at the time of this recording, many people are making resolutions. Like I'm trying to floss at least four times a week. I'd, I'd like to get you know, back on the Peloton at least five or six times a week. And, yeah. and you know, these, these are pretty pedestrian goals. Uh, when it comes to resolutions, you have something a little, little more heroic, a little more ambitious, and I think uh, just more valuable than, you know, any of the dumb stuff I'm doing. Uh, can you share with our audience what you're working on, Jordan? Yeah, happy to share that, Matt. And I'm sure everything you're working on is not dumb at all. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so, you know, to, to what we were kind of just talking about, you know, at the end of uh, 2022, everyone in the cannabis industry was really optimistic that safe banking would pass, right? It had bipartisan support, it had overwhelming popular American support, but it didn't, right? It, it was subjected to the same political gridlock that our federal government seems to be falling victim to more and more by the day. And so in the meantime, right, cannabis companies remain very... Uh, uh, in a very tight spot for raising capital. You know, a lot of these businesses continue to have to operate exclusively in cash, which creates a whole host of unnecessary safety concerns for their employees, for their customers, and for their neighboring communities. 
it makes it such that the operating costs for cannabis companies are much, much higher than they would be otherwise because most traditional banking businesses won't work with them. That in turn increases the price of the licit market relative to the black market. So it's a main driver as to why the black market continues to you know, remain so strong across the country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, um, you know, as, as I've been in the industry for the last several years, and as I mentioned, kind of learned more about the history of the war on drugs, um, I, I have kind of come to the viewpoint that not only has our federal government, you know, really dropped the ball on, on working for the benefit of its people, but that even the, the approach for those who are pushing for sensible cannabis and sensible drug policy uh, it's frankly, it's too, too, too slow. It's too ineffective and, and it's not addressing the core root of the problem. And so uh, with the resolution that I posted uh, about, you know, a week ago or, or whatever, I really thought through just what are, what are some of those root causes of our insane current drug policy, which, which uh, naturally leads into our insane healthcare policy, right? Because the, what we currently call drugs in America and what we currently call medicine in America, <laughs> I think uh, are often driven by arbitrary regulatory lines, which don't match up with either the efficaciousness or the harm of those substances and the quantities that are prescribed to individuals. So anyway, that's my line. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you said a lot of important stuff there. And I think I, I want to take a, a quick step back uh, let's just talk a little bit about the scheduling, and we'll get more in, in, into the weeds, Jordan, but for people sure. who aren't as inside baseball when it comes to cannabis, right now, and it's gosh, been this way since the 70s, uh, cannabis is a Schedule One narcotic, which that means it's the highest, you know, in, in, ter in terms of quote-unquote danger, it's listed as having no medical benefit, uh, with more states than not having medical uh you know legality when it comes to cannabis that seems completely wrong but can you shed a little more insight on on, on what this whole scheduling process is i mean it's it's not just yeah it's not just a list i mean there are very right. real and unfortunately you know crappy uh ramifications from yeah. it so can you can you touch on that please yeah absolutely matt I, I it's a great question and i think it's really important that people understand the history of the war on drugs uh, to understand why the landscape looks as it does today. So in 1970, under President Richard Nixon, we passed the Controlled Substances Act. And that's really been what's, uh, what's set policy, not just for the US for the last 52 years, but also for the world, because the year after the Controlled Substances Act was passed, the U.S. used its authority within the United Nations to pass the Convention on Psychotropic Substances, which effectively codified the CSA globally. So anyway, that CSA uh, set out five schedules of substances that needed to be, you know, uh, either outlawed entirely or had uh, much higher regulatory um, requirements for patients to access. Well, I mean, reefer madness could have taken over the country, Jordan. So, I mean, it's, it's easy with the benefit of hindsight, but please continue. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, um, and so that, as I mentioned, that Controlled Substances Act set out five schedules of potential for abuse for the substances it listed, with Schedule 1 being the highest, Schedule 5 being the lowest, and then, you know, there's certainly substances that aren't subject to the Controlled Substances Act like alcohol, for example, right? And so mm -hmm. being placed in Schedule 1, the most restrictive category, that means by definition, you have a high potential for abuse and that there is no currently accepted medical treatment for the substance. And that's where cannabis has been for the last 53 years. So if, if there's no medical benefit, Jordan, how do all these states have uh, medical marijuana? Yeah, that's a great question, Matt. So first off, because it's been listed in the Schedule 1, designation, it's been exceptionally difficult for any medical researcher to get um, to be able to do any type of clinical studies on the plant, because being a schedule one substance just puts uh, all kinds of bureaucratic red tape that the DEA and other law enforcement agencies place on you. So number one, there just hasn't been the ability to do the medical research studies on the plant that there should have been. Um, mm -hmm. And furthermore, of the studies that are done, on cannabis, 
I think it's over 80% are funded by NIDA, which is the National Institute of Drug Abuse, meaning that those studies are only done to find the potential negative effects of cannabis, not the potential benefits. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think as, as we've learned over the last few years, when it, when it comes to not just cannabis, but diseases and medical treatment in general, no one is totally unbiased. Like everyone seems to have an agenda. And I think if we just accept it, it it's probably better than fighting it. But for something like cannabis or even hemp, like it's a non-psychotropic cousin, um, the research is just awful. I mean, thankfully, there there are really smart scientists and people in Israel who've kind of led the way over the last couple of decades, and thank thank God for them. Um, but if, if I mean, I put my money on this. Like, just have as objective as you reasonably can studies on this, and, and let the chips fall where they may. And I'm really confident it'll do just fine. You know, when it comes to long term health effects, when it comes to to medical benefits when it comes to uh, just societal enhancements, but what say you? Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, but I think, and and look, we saw President Biden last month sign uh, federal legislation into law that will enable it to be easier to do research on cannabis. So, so there's no doubt that there are steps being made in the right direction, right? But I think what our federal government has been really great about doing is misframing the situation so that something can look like a positive step in the right direction. But when you <laughs> zoom out and look at the core root of the problem, you realize you're, you're, you know, putting a bandaid on a gaping festering wound, frankly. Right. And, and as I really thought about it, and this gets back into, you know, why was cannabis, included as a schedule one substance why were psychedelics included as schedule one substances right and and matt before this interview i shared with you a chart that i put together uh recently and I mean, hopefully we can share that with with listeners but mm -hmm. basically what it shows is it's um it's got a chart from a uh, a drug researcher that on one axis has the safety ratio of the drug so how harmful is it per dose and on another ratio has dependence potential, which is how likely uh, is it that you could be um, addicted to this uh, substance. And if you look at this and overlay the schedule one through five of where they these substances ended up on the Controlled Substances Act, it looks like these regulators were just throwing darts at the dartboard, right? It looks like there is absolutely no method to the madness. But in <laughs> fact, there was, Matt, right? There, there was method to the madness, the substances that were placed in Schedule 1 were oftentimes done so in order to deliberately disenfranchise specific groups that the Nixon administration felt was unfavorable to their agenda. Like dirty hippies with their LSD and, and Bob Dylan music were, uh, were running exactly. amok. Exactly. Yep. And several years you know, after, um, after the CSA went into effect, Nixon's uh, chief domestic policy advisor, John Ehrlichman, went on the record with this quote, which you know I'm, I'm sure you've heard before, most in the cannabis industry have heard, but here's the quote. The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about drugs? Of course we did. Yeah, and, and you're not making this up. I mean, this is on the record. I've, I've, I've read it, but, you know, I mean, people freak out over seemingly, like, in my opinion, benign things like, you know, someone will slightly misspeak or they'll use the wrong something or other and it'll make like, it'll trend on Twitter for a day or two. This is like real serious stuff. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very glad you're bringing it up, but like it's, it's really influenced, you know, 50 years plus of, yeah. of policy. I mean, like just imagine if that was 
released today. You know, like if someone said it today, like, and, right. and you know, I mean, I, I think there is a tendency to overreact. This is something that's not an overreaction. Like this, this is some exactly. really bad. Uh, like collectively, I, I think almost no one in the country listening to that now, Jordan, would be like, "Oh, that makes sense." You know, right. like, I, I'm I'm glad that and, and and this is on the record. And and to think, okay, why don't we just immediately eradicate? You know the controlled substance act. Like I mean, it, it was obviously made with with such poor, almost I don't want to say almost, but like hateful reasons. Yeah. What's taken so long? Yeah, and Matt, I think you bring up a good point. And here's what's changed in the last fifty two years: politicians have just gotten smarter about what they say publicly. But <laughs> uh, but seriously, but I mean the intentionality behind what was listed in the CSA and what wasn't, it's still the exact same, right? Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're a Democrat, if you're a Republican, you know, personally, I grew up and, and was uh, strongly affiliated with the Democratic Party until I started to objectively look at their actions and not their words and recognize that. And obviously, this doesn't apply to all of them, same for the Republicans, but but specifically in places of leadership, I've consistently found that our democratic leaders have failed to make any type of improvement that corrects for these horrible inequalities of the war on drugs. And my working hypothesis is that it's because our, po our political leaders are more concerned with progressing the agenda of specific special interest groups than they are with representing the will of the people, regardless of what they say publicly. And I think as it relates to the war on drugs, there are some very specific, very powerful special interest groups that are quietly working to ensure that the existing paradigm does not change, or if it mm -hmm. does, that it does so very slowly in a way that's favorable to them. And who are some of these special interest groups? Yeah, that's uh, that's the million dollar question for sure. Um, you know, and I think that there's a lot of political machinations going on in Washington D.C. that you and I will never have, you know, insight into. But oh, right. from <laughs> from my uh, from what what research I can tell, I, I think three of the most important, if not most important, um, altogether are. The pharmaceutical industry, the for-profit prison industry, and the military-industrial complex. Yeah, I mean, we we could have a whole series of shows on all of those, but I'm going to do my best to <clears throat> kind of summarize the problems with that. And please correct me or you know add your insights. Basically, there are certain lobbies that are industries as well that employ thousands of people that are very entrenched with current systems, and they're used to getting earmarked X number of dollars per year. And people get jobs on those, people get reelected based on keeping this system going. Um, but it can be counter to what's economically efficient, what's you know socially just, and what's really in the interest of the majority. It, is that a pretty good summary or, or where did I go wrong? Yeah, I think you got it spot on. And well, thank you. I, I, got, I get lucky every once and again, Jordan. Um, I wanna get your opinion on something. You, you, you talked about there's been very little, not none, but very little well, in terms on the federal level, political changes. Uh, thankfully, the states have, have really spearheaded this movement, but I remember it wasn't that long ago, uh, very, very vividly is, is February, early March of 2020. I was watching, uh, uh, you know, looking at my stock tickers, uh, MSOS was was booming. I think, uh, you know, a lot of the Canadian licensed producers were doing well. There was a fledgling, not so, uh, there's a growing, you know, US market. And there was so much optimism, Jordan. Uh, you know, the Biden was in office, uh, Democrats were in both chambers. There is bipartisan support. At the very least, you know, the farm bill had passed. That we're going to get safe banking any day now. And safe banking would make it so you don't have to carry tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars on cash. What the hell happened, Jordan? Why, why don't we have it? Yeah. 
It's a great question. So there was a lot of optimism um, after President Biden was elected and the blue wave happened and, and the Democrats took control of both the House and the Senate. Um, and that's what you're referring to. You know, we saw that real pop in early 2021. There was a big, you know, a lot of excitement because people thought federal legalization was going to pass pretty quickly. Um, and then, frankly, I think the the opportunity was just missed, right? You know, with the with the gridlock that continues to plague our federal government, right? Uh, I think momentum is super important for getting any meaningful legislation passed. And I think, you know, that they there was an opportunity to get something done meaningful in early January of 20, or sorry, in early uh, 2021, that, you know, the opportunity was just let slip. But, you know, I think, again, it comes back to, we have to really start, double clicking on our on our presidential and leadership's you know policies right and really asking tough questions so i wrote something pretty critical about president biden recently cuz let's not forget right i mean president biden while you know obviously he claims to represent a progressive platform he's been an insider in washington for decades he was the youngest senator ever elected I think 45 years, oh, going on 50 years, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And throughout that time, he has been a staunch advocate of the war on drugs, right? It's it's interesting. I was going back to watch um, President H.W. Bush's kind of uh, very famous speech against, you know, coming out on the war on drugs happened in 1988. And I was shocked to see about two and a half minutes after that video started it then cuts to none other than Senator Joe Biden, who comes in to say, us on the Democrat side, we need to support the war on drugs because it's causing terrorism and all these things, et cetera, et cetera. Let's not also forget that President Biden was on the Senate Foreign Intelligence Committee for decades as well. So, the But he did pick Kamala American, Harris, who uh, you know had no part in incarcerating people for drug crimes in California. Right, exactly, exactly, right? It's like people just take new platforms when they get on the national stage and just expect everyone to forget their historical hypocrisies. Um, yeah, and, and, and in defense of them, and I, I don't make it a point to defend politicians much on both parties, sure. but, you know, I'll, I'll, people can evolve, people can change their minds. I, I think subsequent to some of the uh, attorney general work that Kamala Harris did, at least she said the right things um, sure. along with Joe Biden. So I, I don't want to give too much credence to what people say. Um, right. But but I mean, I guess all things equal, I'd rather they say the right things, <laughs> you know, than not. But you have, um, I don't want to call it radical, but tangible action plans. And, and mm -hmm. unfortunately, we're, we can't go through every kind of bullet point on it. But your your first one on your resolution was descheduling cannabis mm -hmm. and rescheduling psychedelics. What's the intuition there, Jordan? Yeah, absolutely. And so if you look at that chart that I mentioned before, where you overlaid um, where all the substances ended up on the CSA versus their potential for substance abuse and their potential for dependence. Mm -hmm. You see a very glaring corner at the top left, which is the lowest risk of harm and the lowest risk of potential. And in that corner, you see LSD, psilocybin, and marijuana. And so I like to refer to this corner okay. as this as the corner of nonsense and subjugation. Right. <laughs> and so it's 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 very high upper left. So it means low dependence. Uh, high safety ratio. Because exactly. I just said what you just said, but go ahead. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah. And so I think first off for cannabis, right? I mean, we shouldn't forget common sense, right? And it, and it's easy for Biden to make these kind of patronizing excuses as to why we haven't rescheduled cannabis yet. Well, we still need to do the medical research. Okay, but let's not forget people have been using cannabis for thousands of years, right? Anecdotally, People have still been using it for the last 50 years. We now have 30 states where it's legal. Uh, I, I think we all know just, just based on common sense that there's very limited potential for abuse. And if you look back at why it was included as a Schedule One substance in the first place, despite Nixon's own commission 
recommending that it be excluded entirely, right? It's very Mm -hmm. clear to me at this point that it makes absolutely no sense being a schedule one substance, especially when much more harmful substances like nicotine and alcohol are not on the CSA at all. So, so that's kind of my view on, on cannabis. And then what about, so the, the, I think that is understandable, um, but why not just deschedule psilocybin or psychedelics as well? You know, I, I think eventually that's the path that we should move to right and and if you look at my resolution my my final point was that we need to implement a path to uh withdraw the controlled substances act as well mm-hmm. as the un uh, uh convention on psychotropic substances altogether however i do think that you know we have to recognize uh, a few realities of the society mm-hmm. that we're in today and uh you know frankly the power of these psychedelic substances right and, and the reason i said that we should reschedule them initially is i think um you know, we, we need to recognize that taken in the wrong set and setting these these psychedelic substances do have very significant potential for harm, right? Mm-hmm. I, I never, uh, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of psychedelics. They've made incredible benefits to my own life, but I'm not someone who's going to say we should be putting it in the water or everyone should be taking it. Absolutely <laughs> not. Right. And so while, you know, on this chart, for example, the safety ratio does relate to to physical abuse and there's effectively no risk of physical harm from taking psychedelics. There is certainly risk of, of uh, mental and, and spiritual harm, I'd say too, if, if taken in mm-hmm. the wrong set and setting. So, so that's why I think that it's, it's good to at least have a transition period where people can go into clinics that, are, you know, are hosted by, by experts who, know how to work with the substances and then eventually we can get society to a point where uh access can be more unfettered and we don't have to worry about people just taking them like they do in the current party culture with all drugs where they're all seen as these kind of fun rebellious things that you do and you can mix them all together and and there's no other purpose for taking drugs than to have fun with your friends kind of thing yeah and I mean, you, you, you touch on an important point and that's pragmatism. Uh, you know, when, when you're on the side of one thing, change can't happen soon enough, but inertia is a bitch and yeah. you're, you're fighting a machine. And so sometimes you have to accept incremental progress. And I, you, you kind of inspired a thought that was kind of bedrock in, in me becoming a, an advocate for essentially legalization of all drugs. And and I think that's a different show. And, and I don't want to get into, you know, all the all the specifics on that. But mm-hmm. for me, what it was, I, I'm just going to use cannabis and psychedelics as a, as a short example, Jordan is. Yeah, if you told me, do you want kids to take, you know, 100 milligram edible? No, I don't. Do I want people under 25 getting high every day? No, I don't. Do I, do I want anyone, you know, yeah. downing mushrooms, you know, like it's like their water? No, I, I don't. But the fact of the matter is these drugs are out there. Mm-hmm. They're really out there. You know, in, in many cases, it's easier to get, uh, you know, mushrooms than it is beer if you're a high school student. So it's that's not going to le- le- you know whether there's something's legal or not yeah all it does is impact who's selling it to our kids so yes if it, if there was a situation where the only thing that made access to drugs possible was the legality i would better understand the prohibition argument but that right. is not the case at all look in any prison not just in america in the world any prison wh- whose job is to like keep these substances out these substances are there people so like you know like the onion said the war on drugs is not working it's a dismal failure it's it, you know wave the white flag you've lost severely so now it's like all right now what do you do and, and so I, I think if you frame it in that context it's not so radical to think okay like let, let's go with harm reduction <laughs> right Let, let's not criminalize this Let, let's treat it like overeating or gambling or, right. or other other issues you know so yeah. pardon the rant but you know i'll, I'll see the no, floor to you mr I, I think that's all great points and one thing i'd add right is you know you talk about obviously none of us want kids to be taking 
huge doses of THC, right, or psychedelics, especially when they don't know what they're doing or or in the wrong environment or at the wrong dosage. But let's also not forget, you know, the incidence of underage drinking in our country is rampant, right? And I, I've seen statistics, I can't remember the exact numbers, but the vast majority of teenagers first sexual experience is under the influence of alcohol, right? And it's like, if you take an objective look at our culture, at our media, at our entertainment, we glorify the partaking in certain substances, like we, we call it liquid courage, you know, exactly. Helps exactly. white people dance. I mean, it's it's there. It's in songs. It's it's yeah. yeah in the and, and we have to keep asking why, Matt. Right? If you look at this same chart, I keep referring to alcohol mm -hmm. is in that pretty much bottom corner, just just shy of heroin in terms of both the risk of dependence and harm. Yet it's not on the CSA, right? And it's my view that a big part of that is because alcohol results in behaviors that make people more easy to control. Psychedelics are the total opposite, right? They encourage free thought, they encourage independent thinking, and uh, and that's something that scares those in power, frankly. Well, that's very very interesting. So, I mean, with that in mind, you, you're you're kind of tackling the bear head on. What you know? What do you hope to achieve from this resolution? You know, I think um, first and foremost, it's raising public awareness, right? You know, mm -hmm. I know, I, and I specifically called it a revolutionary policy in, in my post because I know it's very orthogonal and and kind of outside the the realm of what even folks uh, pushing for change. Have an uh, and great non-physics use of orthogonal, Jordan, but go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so, but nonetheless, right, I think uh, I think it's all actually logical and, and gets to the root cause. And so if, if at the very least, I can put it in people's public awareness of just saying, hey, you know, we don't need to be constrained by these gradualistic marginal approaches that have been advocated by our politicians for decades right we can really start to think outside the box and understand what are some of the underlying causes of our current paradigm of drug policy and who are some of these powerful forces that maybe aren't as vocal but are very significant in impacting the inertia mm -hmm. and uh you know what what can we do what can I do? What can our listeners do? I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll post your, your resolution, but what are some tangible steps we can take? Yeah, I, that's a great question, Matt. I think um, a few things. Number one, just getting more engaged with the political environment, right? I, I saw a stat late recently that was like, Congress has like a 24% approval rating, yet a 94% re-election rate, right? <laughs> wow. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And it's like, we need to recognize that if and when our political parties and our political representatives are no longer representing what's best for the will of the people, that we have the power to change the system, to add new parties, right? To vote in people who actually will do the right things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's number one is just re remembering that the power is yours. It's not the government's and that, you know, it's it's not cool to just not care, to be apathetic and just say, we're going to let hell, you know, the, the country go to hell in a handbasket, right? Like it's, it's time to stand up and do something about it. So I think that's first. Um, I think second, you know, get educated on the subject for sure. Right. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, Johan Hari wrote an excellent book called chasing the scream, which gets into the whole history of the war on drugs, why it's been so, so unsuccessful, why, for example, in Portugal decriminalized all drugs 15 years ago, addiction rates mm -hmm. halved, right? All this, all these things to really support it. So I think learning more about that is really important. And I, I would say also, and this is, um, you know, a, a bit of a more challenging topic for folks, but I think learning about, the intelligence agency's historic and ongoing involvement in the war on drugs, or or rather the illicit drug trafficking trade, right? Really, frankly, playing both sides of this industry. Uh, I think once we understand the depths of agencies, also under the control of our executive government, by the way, mm -hmm. the depths that they have been involved in profiteering off the illicit drug trade, then people are going to start to connect a lot of dots as to why we haven't seen more positive movement. Yeah, I mean, this is not tinfoil hat to say the the war on drugs is job security for three letter agencies. Totally, it's, it's true. Like, 
if 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 your job is largely dependent on fighting drugs and people who take them and and sell them and you know ancillary services you're you're used to it if tomorrow that's off the table and and i don't think these people are bad for for feeling you know i i think it's human nature i'm not knocking you know cops or or agencies like individually i I think policy wise they they have major stuff to work on but it's like if if you're used to doing one thing and you've been doing it for 25 years and tomorrow you can't do that one thing it's not going to feel good right and and, and what you're doing and it's it's not going to feel good to very concentrated powerful well well financially backed institutions however it's going to do a world of good for you know everyone else yep matt and i'm really glad that you brought that point up um, because I also want to say, you know, I think that the vast majority, 90% plus of law enforcement agents, of intelligence agents, you know, uh, across the board are super great patriotic men and women who got into their career paths to um, really fight crime and to try and make the world a better place. What I think the harsh reality is that there are undoubtedly criminal factions within our three-letter agencies who have taken advantage of our highly compartmentalized, highly secretive intelligence agencies to act as agents of of organized crime. Frankly, there's no other way to put it. And so uh, we, we have to, we the American people, have to demand accountability. We have to question, hey, why is it that the Pentagon hasn't passed an audit in, you know, I don't know, ever, right? Where, where is <laughs> yeah. that money going? What is it, happening? It, it, I, I know I'm being a little facetious, but if, if you Venmo someone $600, you're probably at a bigger risk of getting audited than if you uh, can't account for 2.3, what, trillion at the Pentagon or, or some ridiculously large number. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing, right? The numbers just get so astronomical that it's... It's difficult for us to, as a you know, as you and I, who who never, never, you know, getting getting to a million dollars would be super exciting, right? Much less a trillion dollars, right? So it's hard yeah. to hard to uh, conceptually even wrap your head around it. But but that is it, it, an insane true. amount of money, Matt. And, and Where's it going? Oh, sorry, we can't find it. Whoops. You know, I, I mean, any publicly traded company, you know. Uh, <laughs> would be raked over the barrel for such, you know, poor accounting. But th- these are, are three-letter agents. And it, it shows, like, w- once you just have money coming in, you know, once once you have that pipeline of money coming in, you, 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 you get lazy with it. And, and you do stuff that, you know, private market people would be fired immediately for. Well, right. I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to depress her. I mean, obviously, like, I love what you're doing, both professionally and and kind of uh, we'll call it politically. But I think it's it's a little more than that. It, it's just, it, it's almost more neighborly or spiritually. Um, you know, if we rely on politicians, I, I think you know, regardless of party, that's a losing situation. They're they're at best a necessary evil, in, in my humble opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, but what are you optimistic about, you know, kind of outside of, yeah. of just this specific, like what, what, what gives you hope? Man, so much gives me hope, Matt. Um, I think one, the fact that we're having these types of conversations, right. That it's out in the public ethos. I mean, there have been people who have been raising these concerns about the war on drugs, about, uh, the involvement of three letter agencies and that sort of thing for decades now. Right. And I think we're finally at that breaking point where, where people are waking up to the lies and, and, and the systemic injustices that have been built around them. And we're getting to a point that, you know, people aren't going to take it anymore. And it's kind of like that whole philosophy that, times of crisis are also times of great opportunity. And and maybe this is exactly what the American public needs to be shaken out of its general apathy, right? And complacency with our places, the top country in the world, the top economy in the world, nothing's ever going to change. Our civil liberties are guaranteed and we don't need to protect them, right? All this kind of stuff that we've been fooled into believing. Mm -hmm. 
Well, beautifully, it reminds me of an old quote. It's it's a it's a people with a government, not a government with a people. And and when you realize they're looking to get reelected, they will they will follow and change. Uh, you know, <laughs> on the drop drop of a hat. So, yeah. um, you know, where where can people support you? What you're doing? How can we kind of, you know, r- rally folks around you, Jordan? Yeah, that's a great question, Matt. So, you know, we're still kind of in the early phases of. Um, figuring out exactly how we're going to uh, present this, this policy proposal and what format, right? But I definitely, first priority for me is getting input and feedback from other leaders across our industry and, and in the uh, criminal justice reform movement, such as yourself, to just say, hey, you know, here's, here's where I think we can do some real good. You know, I want to come out guns blazing and just say, hey, here's, here's what's really going on from our perspective those of us in the sensible drug policy side of the equation, here's here's one idea for how we can really try to make some big sweeping change all at once. So if you have ideas on on that front, you know those are are super well uh, accepted. Please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. You can shoot me an email at jordan at keyinvestmentpartners.com. And then I think as we really form formulate either like a uh, a committee to put this together or, or figure out exactly what the drafting process is going to look like. Uh, you know, certainly ha- happy to keep anyone who's interested uh, involved and in, in abreast of how that's going. Well, keep, keep me in- abreast. I'm very interested. I'm going to support you every step of the way. And thank you for joining us uh, once again on the Matt Ballinger podcast. Really appreciate it, Jordan. Absolutely. Thanks again for having me, Matt. Happy to uh, join anytime. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Matt Balaker podcast. To learn more, please check out mattbalaker.com and encourage your friends to like, subscribe, and share. Really appreciate it. Mm-hmm.